Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, which is a look at the ANSYS mechanical fatigue module or fatigue tool in, in ANSYS mechanical. Just, I just want to introduce, if I can, the EDR Medeso group. Uh, we're an elite channel partner of ANSYS. We provide ANSYS software, ANSYS support, services and training uh, across Northern Europe. Founded about 35 years ago in, in, in the Nordics, and we and we moved into the UK in 2018. And we look after about 16, 1,600 customers across those regions. So today's topic, I uh, just want to talk a little bit about metal fatigue, what it is, give a little bit of an overview. So metal fatigue occurs when uh, a component, uh, a metallic uh, structure will fail often fail under cyclic loading at values that are, are lower than the yield point or the UTS. So when you are, when, when a structure is subject to cyclic loading, it, feel, it fails prematurely. There are three stages to, to fatigue. Crack initiation, so this is development of a crack, crack growth, and then um, final failure. In some components, the crack initiation is what we're interested in. Once you have a crack in the in the in the component, it will fail very rapidly. So all we're interested in calculating the the number of cycles or the time to crack initiation. In other problem areas, other structures, things like civil structures, maybe uh, bridges and so on, we can tolerate some cracks in the in the structure, and we just want to calculate how quickly those cracks will grow, and that's called uh, fracture mechanics or crack propagation analysis. With the ANSYS fatigue module, we're interested in the first of these problems, so time to crack initiation. With ANSYS, we can model crack growth, we can do fracture mechanics, but it's not covered in today's webinar, and it's not covered in the functionality in the fatigue module. So what is metal fatigue? Well, crack initiation occurs when we get a buildup of micro -dislo dislocations in the crystalline structure of metals. So under cyclic loading, we get these dislocations, they, they increase, we call those damage, and they eventually move to the grain boundaries where when where they, they form micro cracks. And when you get enough of these micro cracks, it turns into a macro crack and we have crack initiation. Typically, those cracks form on the surface. The surface of a structure is typically the uh, area of high, high stress. Uh, and, and quite often they occur where there's a stress razor on the surface. Uh, there's a picture on the right hand side there of the Diavolin Comet. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody's aware of this story. I've heard it many times over the years, but uh, the Diavolin Comet is a, a sort of an example of where metal fatigue can result in catastrophic and commercial failure. Uh, this was the, the Diavolin Comet was the first uh, commercial uh, jet airline. It was released in 1952 and initially it was very successful. Uh, it was adopted by a number of airlines, and it looked like dominating the jet uh, the jet airline industry. But within a couple of years, they started to fall out of the sky. There was a few incidents, and eventually the Diavolin Comet was grounded until it could be proven safe. Uh, it was subjected to a number of tests down in Farnborough in the UK, where the cabin was repeatedly pressurized like it would be uh, in flight using water. And they eventually found that cracks formed in the windows, fatigue cracks. And this was the first, one of the first studies in detail on, on, on metal fatigue. Incidentally, the fatigue cracks formed in the windows, the windows were square in shape. Uh, so if you wonder why your windows are round or, or, or curved on aeroplanes today, it's, it's from the developments made with the Diablon Comet. With regards to calculating uh, time to crack initiation, there are two approaches that are available in the ANSYS fatigue module, ANSYS fatigue tool. There's what we call stress life or the strain life. So stress life uh, is typically found in, is what we call high cycle fatigue. So it's found in components where fatigue failure occurs uh, above 10,000 cycles. 10,000 is sort of an arbitrary number, but a good number. Uh, to use if you're considering whether it should be a high cycle fatigue or low cycle fatigue problem. Um, 
strain life is used for low cycle fatigue, so typically less than 10,000 cycles, and is usually, uh, usually there's some level of plasticity when strain life is the dominating, uh, uh, the dominating mechanism. Both approaches use an empirical approach, so we're not actually modeling the dislocations in the structure. What we actually do is compare the stress in the FEA model uh, to, to, to stress versus number of cycles from testing of an ideal test piece. So let's start by looking at the stress life approach, the SN approach, as we call it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to start off with the material properties. So the material properties uh, for fatigue life, is for, for stress-based fatigue life, is what we call an SN curve. So what we do is we take a fatigue test piece, we put it into a rig, and we load it with some stress value, let's say 100 megapascals. And then we fully reverse this in the test rig, so we take it from uh, 100 megapascals in, in tension to 100 megapascals in compression, and that's called a fully reverse cycle. And we repeat that until the test piece fails, and we count, and we count number of cycles. And that gives us one data point on the SN curve. We can then repeat that test at different stress levels, and we build up what's called an SN curve. So on this slide, we can see the SN curve that you that comes with the default material and is in ANSYS mechanical. Uh, and one thing to note about the SN curve and in fatigue in general. Uh, the, 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 the number of cycles to failure is logarithmic in nature. So if we plot linear on the left-hand side and logarithmic on the right-hand side, you would usually plot the SN curve in, uh, using the logarithmic scale, as we can see on the right-hand side. Being logarithmic in nature is quite important because it means ultimately a very small increase or very small decrease in loading conditions or number of cycles or cyclic loading can quickly move a, a structure from being in a, a suspect, susceptible to fatigue damage or to, uh, if you like, having an infinite life. So I've mentioned the, 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 the calculating the time to crack initiation is an empirical approach. So we do an FE analysis, we look at the stress level in the FE analysis, and then we assume in its simplest form we, we are fully cycling this stress value, and then we can compare that to the SN curve or the test data and obtain the actual number of, number of cycles to failure. So in its simplest form, uh, our FE model is assumed to be fully reversed about a zero mean. We call this sort of uh, analysis constant amplitude proportional loading, and we assume the FE model assumes uh, with linear behavior. So let's have a look at how we would do this. So I'm gonna start off with a demo of constant amplitude proportional loading. So I have a simple model here. It's, it's actually of a test piece itself. And what I wanna do is calculate the stress in this test piece and then compare it to the SN curve. And that will demonstrate how the actual fatigue module works in principle. So in this, let's start off just putting a mesh on this test piece. I'm gonna put a 0.5 millimeter mesh on here. Let's generate the mesh. And let's just have a look at that. Incidentally, I'm using the latest version of ANSYS here. It produces a very nice mesh on cylindrical components like this. Uh, it's one of the uh, new modifications made in the current release. So I'm gonna, I've got a mesh on there. I'm quite happy with that. I'm going to fix the bottom of this test piece. So I'll add a fixed support. And then I'm going to apply a tensile load on here of 1,500 newtons. And then we're going to calculate in here the equivalent stress, maximum principle, minimum principle, the normal stress in the y direction, which is the direction in which we're loading it. And I'm also going to put in some uh, vector principle stresses. And I'm going to scope those to this middle surface. 
And let's just calculate this. Should calculate very quickly. It's a fairly simple linear model. So we've got some results. And if we look at the equivalent stress, it's at 187, uh, 188. Uh, because it's a uniaxial case, uh, the maximum principal stress is also 188, and the normal stress in the y direction is also uh, 188. And if we look at the principal stress vectors, I'll just change these to solid form, grid aligned, and just scale them a little bit. We can see the principal stress is aligned with the test piece and the loading, as we would expect. So if we go down to our material properties, when we're doing the fatigue tool, I said we're comparing the stress level to the SN curve. So we can do this manually for a simple case like this. So if I go into my material properties and open up the uh, SN table, here we can see our 188 stress level, alternating stress level, will give us a life somewhere between 20,000 and 100,000 cycles, probably near to the 20,000. So let's just see what happens when we do use the fatigue tool on this simple case. So if I come back here and I insert the fatigue tool, and when we insert the fatigue tool, we, we can specify how the load is behaving. So um, when we open it, it's we're following this pattern, this sinusoidal wave here, it's the cyclic behavior. And we're cycling this test piece from uh, plus one multiply of the load to minus one multiply of the load. So if you, in effect, we're, we're applying a, a, a 1500 Newton in tension and then a 1500 Newton in compression, it's fully reversed about a zero mean. So let's go in here and add life. As a result of fatigue result, I'll add damage, I'll add safety factor and I'll add by axiality indication. Uh, if we just go back, I'll just go back actually, and in here I'm using the equivalent stress. I could use maximum principle, I could use normal in Y. They're, they're all the same in this case. Uh, the damage and factor of safety, um, we have to give a design life to get meaningful results. So I'll explain the results when we get them, but let's say we want this component to last a minimum of 10,000 cycles. So we put in a design life of 10,000 cycles, and then we'll just solve for the fatigue. So here we've got life. If we look at life, we can see, oops, let me just, I made a mistake there. Let's just clear those results. And I forgot to scope these to that center surface and we'll just solve them again so you can see life at the center of this test piece is now 32,000 so we're effectively reading off the SN curve we said it was somewhere between 20,000 100,000 and that's what it's given us uh, just to explain the damage result the damage result we put in a minimum life that we want to achieve of 10,000 cycles uh, we know it's going to last 30,000 cycles. So at 10,000 cycles, we've taken 31% of the life or the test piece is 31% damaged. And the safety factor is, if you like, is the inverse of that. This is the amount of load we, we need to multiply before we're actually uh, failing the component. So we, a factor of safety of less than one means we, we, we're not going to achieve the design life. So that's fully reversed, constant amplitude, proportional loading. And it's, it's, it's the simplest case. We're just comparing the results to the SN curve. Now, obviously, in that example, uh, we, we cycled the load from a positive of plus one multiplier to a negative, a, plus one, a negative multiplier of minus one. So from plus 1,500 newtons down to minus 1,500 newtons, or tension to compression. Quite often when we're analyzing our components and the components are going through cycle, uh, cyclic loading, uh, the load isn't fully reversed. It's quite often full load on 
full load off, full load on, full load off. In that case, we're doing what's called zero based cycling. So it's similar to the second image down here. We're taking it from full load down to zero, full load down to zero. Now, when we're doing this, uh, we have what's called a non-zero mean. So now it's not, we, we can't just compare the cyclic load into the SN curve. We need to take into account that there's a non-zero mean. So the ANSYS fatigue module allows you to handle the non-zero mean using a number of different theories. So over the years, there's various uh, studies being done and different theories that have been formed that um, allow you to adjust the SN curve based on a non-zero mean. So if you plot uh, in the graphic, we can see if we plot the mean stress along the x-axis and the alternating stress on the vertical axis, uh, and in this case, we're looking at the Goodman method. We can see as we increase the mean stress, the alternating stress that we can endure it reduces until we get to the ultimate tensile stress. So the Goodman is good for low ductility materials. It has no correction for compressive stress. So we've got a negative mean down here. Uh, we have no adjustment. The Soderberg is very similar, but it's a little bit more conservative. So the Soderberg is this profile here, going down to yield rather than the ultimate tensile stress. The Gerber follows this curved profile. So it gives poor results in compression, uh, but good for tensile stresses. And then the ASME is an, ASME, uh, is, is an adapted Gerber profile where you get a curve when you've got a tensile mean stress that looks like this. And then lastly, the ANSYS fatigue tool allows you to put mean stress curves in there. So if you've done your, uh, if you've done your material testing at various different mean stress levels, so you've got multiple SN curves, you can enter those multiple SN curves and ANSYS will interpolate between those and it will use those values directly. So let's just go back to our model and look at um, non-zero mean. Okay, so... If we go back down to our fatigue tool, this is what we did before, a fully reverse cycle. If we go down here and we select zero based, you can see now what we're doing is loading the test piece up to full load and then taking the load off. We're not fully reversing it. But now we have a non-zero mean, which is approximately half the load or half the stress level if it's a, a linear analysis. So we have to correct for this non-zero mean. So you've got the different theories down here. Uh, sorry, wrong box, down here. We've got Goodman, I'm gonna use the Goodman. So I've got this green profile that we saw before. And essentially what's happened here, now because I've, I've, I'm on the zero based, my actual stress amplitude is half. I'm going to full load down to zero. So my stress amplitude is half. So my life will go up. But because I've got a non-zero mean, it will be corrected for the non-zero mean, so it will drop back down slightly. So let's see what that does to our results. Again, calculating the fatigue is just a post-processing exercise. We don't need to do the full solution. So now we can see my life has gone from 32,000 cycles up to 176,000 cycles. And this is because we've re reduced or we've halved the cyclic amplitude. Just have a look at the damage. Now we're only taking 5% of life and the safety factor is quite high. Just want to talk a little bit about the fatigue strength factor. Uh, you can see the box here highlighted in yellow. The fatigue strength factor is if you like, um, I, I don't like using the word, but it's a fiddle factor, an adjustment factor. Uh, if you imagine when you're doing this fatigue testing, you will normally do this on pretty good quality material. Uh, the tensile test pieces will be manufactured to be as consistent as possible. They usually have highly uh, polished surface finishes, so we can get high, highly accurate results. And as a result, the SN curve is usually based on what we call perfect conditions. When you produce a, a, a component or a structure and it's subjected to, to real life conditions, it often has things like material imperfections. It could have inclusions you know, that, that, that occur during the casting process. 
uh, it may have surface finishes a rough surface finish it may have localized stress lasers these sort of things can reduce the actual fatigue life in the field compared to the SN curve in, in the perfect conditions there is also the alternative quite often uh, in the real world you may do things to enhance the fatigue life so things like uh, shot peening uh, surface hardening those sort of things so uh, surface processes can increase the fatigue life so this fatigue strength factor is really just an adjustment factor and what it does is adjust the alternating stress accordingly to take into account real life factors i've often heard for these things material imperfections surface finishes localized stress raises a value of 0.7 might be a good value to use to be in the conservative regime but it's up to you as a user okay so we looked at zero based and we looked at fully reverse cycles what we call constant amplitude proportional loading one of the other conditions you might want to look at and it quite often often happens with reciprocating machinery is moving from one load case to another load case so you're cycling between a maximum load case and a minimum load case you have two load cases in your model and you want to use those two load cases as the extremes for your fatigue calculations we do this by using solution combinations so i've got an example here of how we do non-proportional loading and i'm going to use this is a little bit more like a real life component it's connecting rod uh, and if you imagine the connecting rod operating in a, in a four stroke engine it has two extreme cases the first extreme case of loading is what we call the firing condition so the firing condition occurs when you have combustion in the engine block uh, you get maximum cylinder pressure on the piston and it pushes the con rod into into a compression and it, it, it compressively loads the con rod so we're going to model that case uh, as the firing case so first of all i'm going to support down here we'll put a, a a cylindrical support in here on the big end and then we'll put a bearing load on the small end which to represent the pin so if we're going to load put a bearing load uh, and the bearing load is in compression so I'm just going to use components and I'm going to put minus 25,000 newtons. So now we've got a compressive load. Now in the engine, the actual firing load occurs not in the vertical position like this. It occurs, it is timed to occur just after top dead center to get to provide the maximum torque or maximum power to the engine. So we're going to model that by just creating a, an offset coordinate system. So I'm going to put a coordinate system here, rename it as firing CS. And we will base this by just rotating about the global coordinate system by three degrees. So we can see here, if I just toggle between my firing coordinate system, if you just look at the triad at the big end, you can see it moving slightly. And we're going to use this firing coordinate system as the coordinate system for this compression load the bearing load that we've applied so that's our firing case now before i go on to the non-firing case i'm just going to create uh, just run the calculation so i'm just going to insert equivalent stress and we'll just run this just put a mesh on here 2.5 millimeters and let's solve this now i'm solving this first before doing the fatigue calculation because i want to um i want to examine where the maximum stress is and then we'll look at the mass maximum stress location just for fatigue life just to make it a little bit more simple to follow the demonstration So here we've got the maximum equivalent stress. We can see actually the, it, it's a little bit eccentric due to that uh, coordinate system, the offset that we applied. And if we pick out the maximum, we can see it's occurring at this point here. So I'm going to create a construction point where the maximum is and then scope the rest of the results at that construction point so we can see what's going on in terms of fatigue just to that construction point. 
So the way to do that, or the way I like to do it, is go into model and insert virtual topology. Let's just look at the mesh. So this was the maximum node. I think the maximum should follow, the true maximum should follow that center line. So I'm going to put a point there, create a hard vertex, and we can see I've got a construction point there that I can scope results to. So I'm just going to go down to the solution branch, insert equivalent stress, maximum principal stress, minimum principal stress, normal stress, and the principal stress vector. And we'll scope all those to our point, our virtual point. And we will calculate those in a second. So we're going to track the results of that individual point. And we know that from our first analysis, that's the, the maximum or the area of interest. So the second uh, load case in, 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 the, in a Conrod when it's in a four-stroke engine is the top dead center non-firing case. So if I duplicate this, and in the top dead center, I'll just rename this, top dead center non-firing. In the top dead center non-firing case, this is when we're on the non-firing stroke and the piston, there's a lot of inertia in the piston, pulling the conrod into tension. So as it goes through the four stroke cycle, we have a compression on the conrod and then we have a tension on the conrod and that cycling load will give us the maximum fatigue damage. So on this non-firing case, the cylindrical support, as I said, we're in tension now, needs to be on this bottom face. So I'll select the bottom face and change the cylindrical support there. And then the bearing load needs to be on this top face. And this time, I'm going to put a 5,000 Newton tension load, which represents the inertia of the pin and the piston pulling on the conrod. And because the inertia load case occurs at top dead center, we will use the global coordinate system. There is no eccentricity in this, in this load case. So here we've got two load cases. Let's just solve those. And these two load cases are going to represent the extremes for our fatigue calculation. So we've calculated those two load cases. Oh, no, we haven't. We're still running the second one. We have now, so we've finished those results. So if we select the equivalent stress from the firing case, we can see it's 124 megapascals. The maximum principal stress is quite low because we're in compression. The minimum principal stress is quite high because we're in compression. And the normal stress is pretty close to the minimum. Uh, the normal stress in the X direction is pretty close to the minimum principal stress. If we look at the tensile case, the maximum principal stress, again, is quite low because it's a smaller load case. The minimum principal stress is zero. Uh, the equivalent stress is quite low. Uh, and the normal stress is quite low. So in terms of the worst case scenario, the uniaxial or near uniaxial case with the worst amplitude is the normal stress. So it's going from minus 121 megapascals in the compressive case in the firing cycle to a 12 or 13 megapascal in the non-firing cycle. So we want to use the normal stress in terms of how we calculate life. So to calculate life from non-proportional loading, that's loading between two separate load cases, we use solution combinations. So I'm going to go down and put in solution combination. For those of you not aware of this tool, solution combination is usually used for adding two, load, two or more load cases together. But we conveniently use it for fatigue life for non-proportional loading. So I'm just going to define my two load cases in the solution combination. 
So we've got the firing and non-firing cycle. And then if I insert the fatigue tool, now I need to select here that we've got a non-proportional. We have an extra option down here because it's attached to the solution combination. I need to specify this non-proportional loading. If you don't specify this, it will do a standard fatigue calculation as we've just seen uh, a proportional loading fatigue case based on the two results added together, which isn't what we want. So down here, if I go down, obviously the mean stress is going to be non-zero. So we need a mean stress theory in there. I'm going to use Goodman again. And this is the stress component. Now, we just looked at the stresses. We don't think equivalent stress will give us the right stress range. We don't think max principle will give us the right stress range. We do think normal X will give us the correct stress range or the worst case stress range for calculate fatigue. So we'll use normal X. I'm going to go down. I'm going to calculate life. I'm going to calculate damage. I'm going to calculate safety factor. I'm going to calculate by axiality indication. And I'm going to add fatigue sensitivity. And I'm going to scope those results to our construction point or vir virtual point, if you like. And the last thing I need to do is calculate is enter a design life for a desired design life for the damage and safety factor calculation. Now, typically on engine test components like this, we'll run a, a 1,000 hours at something like max power or max torque, which is equivalent to one E to the eight cycles. So that's our design life. So let's go ahead and calculate that. So we've got our results at this point of interest. We can see our calculated life is two e to the eight cycles. So that is telling me my conrod is going to last for twice as long as my design life, which is good. If we check the damage, uh, again, the damage reiterates that at our design life of one e to the eight cycles, we've taken just under 50 percent of the life of the conrod. And if we go down to safety factor, we've got a safety factor of more than one. It's only slightly above one, because as I said at the beginning, uh, fatigue is, 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 is logarithmic in nature. So this safety factor takes into account that logarithmic nature. And if I go down to the fatigue sensitivity plot down here, I scroll down. Our loading case represents one here. If we read up from this, we can see our fatigue life comes across uh, just above 2e to the 8 cycles. So that's what we've calculated. This fatigue sensitivity plot says what happens if we increase the load or decrease the load. And we can see here if we increase the load only slightly, uh, we rapidly come into a regime where our conrod will fail due to fatigue. And the amount of load increment is what's given in this safety factor. So if we go up to 1.01 of the loading, I scroll down, we'll take it to about here where our fatigue life drops below one to the one e to the eight, our design life. Similarly, if we reduce the loading slightly or strengthen the con rod, this represents infinite life. So we can quickly uh, make modifications to our con rod that will bring the fatigue life into infinite life. So that's constant amplitude non-proportional loading when you've got when you've got cycling between two separate load cases. I just want to discuss briefly biaxiality. So all the examples I've done so far, the test piece and the conrod, they're really uniaxial cases. Uh, we, we're, we're applying the load and removing the load uniaxially. The stress tensors within the structure do not rotate between the two cases, the maximum and minimum cases, and we call that uniaxial. In many uh, models, many structures, there is biaxiality between the two load cases. So if you've got some sort of twisting or the loading in different directions, you will get bi biaxiality in your model. And essentially, the ANSYS fatigue module does not fully handle bi biaxial cases. So it's really a tool for uniaxial cases. One of the things it 
does do, it gives you a biaxiality indication. So the higher the level of biaxiality when you're using the fatigue module, the fatigue tool in ANSYS Mechanical, the less accurate the result. Um, you can, by using things like signed von Mises, make sure that you gain a conservative result, but you, you're losing some level of accuracy. So ANSYS will give you this tool, uh, the biaxiality tool, which will give you an indication uh, of, of how far from that uniaxial case you are or how inaccurate you are. So let's just take a quick look at that. So again, if we go back to our tensile test piece, if we look at our first model that we, we first did, we can see our uh, maximum minimum principal stresses are aligned with the Y direction, and it's a uniaxial case. And if we select by axiality indication, and just probe the value, you can see we've got a value of, of zero or as close as damn it to zero. So I'm just going to rename this, let's call it uniaxle. So we know our life results are good because it's a uniaxle case. And if I duplicate this, and in the duplicate model, I'm going to remove that tensile force. And on this face here, I'm going to insert a moment. So we're going to twist this tensile test piece. I'm going to twist this test piece, should I say, rather than load it uh, uniaxially. Click solve. So when I saw these mod this model, this time if we look at the principal stress vectors, you can see they've rotated significantly as we apply that loading. And now if we go down to our fatigue tool and look at the biaxiality indication, we've got a perfectly biaxial case. The biax biaxial value is minus one. So really the fatigue tool is, is not uh, appropriate for this type of loading. Let's just have a look at our Conrod. And if we go down, we calculated our fatigue life and we, we uh, also added the biaxiality value here. And it's close to zero. So we could say that our results are pretty good. There is a small offset and that was from the eccentricity in the firing load. So biaxiality, uh, it does introduce in the fatigue tool a, a problem in terms of accuracy. If you have biaxial or multi-axial cases, how do we handle those? Well, unfortunately, you can't handle them correctly in the ANSYS fatigue tool. You need to go up into a higher level product. ANSYS can provide you, your ANSYS supplier, ED Amadeso, can provide you with what's called ANSYS Encode Design Life. And it's based on the Encode suite of fatigue tools produced by HBM. And in Encode, what it actually does for each node on the model, it resolves the direct stresses into planes at 10 degree intervals. So if you like, for every node, it does, it calculates the direct stress uh, amplitude from maximum to minimum and the mean stress at every angle. And then at each of those angles, it calculates the fatigue life and then it reports the minimum fatigue life or the maximum damage based on, on the, the, the actual direct stresses at whatever angle. And this is called critical plate analysis. As I Jen mentioned, it's not available in the ANSYS fatigue module, the ANSYS fatigue tool. You do need up to upgrade if you have highly multi-axle or biaxial stress states. I want to talk about, so far we've talked about sort of constant amplitude loading, where we're cycling between a high and a low value. Quite often you want to do fatigue calculations on a much more complex load history, something like you can see in the, in the image on the right hand side. Now, how do we handle that? Well, the way we look at it is we do, the way we handle it, we do what's called rain flow cycle counting. So in this complex load history, we look at individual peaks and troughs, troughs in the, the actual cyclic loading. And we take the amplitude from each peak and trough and the mean 
and we place it in a bin uh if you like or we put it into into a bucket or a container and then we do that for the all of the signal and all the all the uh repetitions that have a similar uh amplitude and simple mean stress we put in the, into the same bucket and then we can calculate the amount of damage those cycles do so we count the number of cycles at, in, in each bucket or in each bin and we calculate the damage of that bucket or that bin and then we add the damage together using this rule, a palm gren minor rule, to give us the total life. And the life, when we've got a complex load history, is given in terms of repetitions of the block. So if this rep represented one hour of data uh, and we got a, a life of 1,000 repetitions, then we'd have uh, 1,000 hours of life. The rainflow matrix, we can get a plot of rainflow matrix. We'll see this in a minute in the demo. So each of these blocks in the rainflow matrix represents a bucket or a bin, if you like, of mean stress, sorry, mean stress, alternating stress, and then cycle counts. So we can see here this red one, this red bin, if you like, has a large number of cycle counts that have a very low alternating stress. This, uh, this bin here, as a very high alternating stress with a very small cycle count. If we convert that to damage, we can see these fewer counts of the high alternating stresses are the ones that are doing most of the damage. And when we sum all this together, we can calculate life. So let's look at variable amplitude proportional loading. So for those of you that have uh, attended some of my webinars before you may have seen this model i use it quite a lot and what i'm going to do here is i'm going to add a point mass that represents some equipment on this frame maybe a motor or something so let's insert a point mass i'll attach it to these pads and we'll give it a 500 kilogram mass and I'll offset it slightly in the Y direction. So we can see we've got a point mass offset attached, attached to these pads. That represents some peripheral equipment attached to this, uh, this frame. I'm gonna fix the frame on the ends. So we'll go down and insert, fix support, and then we'll insert an acceleration. I'm gonna, Put this acceleration in the negative y direction and i'm going to set that equal to 1g so the reaction load will be in the positive y direction and that is 1g let's just put a mesh on this model so i'm going to put 25 millimeter global mesh and i know my maximum stress is going to occur in this member here so i'm going to put a, a finer mesh control of five millimeters on this member Let's just generate the mesh. And I'm sort of happy with that. And then let's go down and insert some results. So let's just switch that mesh back off. Zoom in here. I'm interested in results on this upper surface. I'm going to insert, as before, equivalent stress. Maximum principal stress, minimum principal stress, normal stress. And we're interested in the X direction. I'm expecting this member to, to bow. So the maximum stress will be in the X direction. And I'm going to put the vector principles in there. And then let's look at life. Let's just go and insert the fatigue module, the fatigue tool. And this time in life, I'm going to use a complex load history. So if you imagine this frame maybe attached to the chassis of a truck or maybe a train or something like that. So it's seen some sort of measured or repeated vibration. So we're going to use this load history here. Now I'm going to normalize this because it's going up to 1000. So I'm just going to normalize this to one. I put in a scale factor in. So this represents our G loading, if you like. Uh, I'm going to use the normal X on that upper surface. Did I scope these to the upper surface? I forgot. No, it's all bodies. Let me just scope those results to the upper surface. 
to them all. And then the fatigue tool will insert life, damage, safety factor, biaxiality indication. And this time we'll put in the rainflow matrix, the damage matrix, and the fatigue sensitivity. And we'll scope the, these values also to this upper surface. For some reason, ANSYS won't, won't let me scope biaxiality in. Sorry, rainflow matrix and damage matrix at the same time as the other results. And also the fatigue sensitivity I need to scope separately. So these results are scoped to this upper surface. And then lastly, we need to enter for damage and safety factor what our uh, proposed design life is. So we want it to last 1,000 repetitions of that load history. So we'll put 1,000 blocks in there. So let's go away and solve this. Now, because we're doing the rainflow cycle counting, the fatigue life takes a little, calculating the fatigue life, even though it's a post-processing exercise, takes a little bit longer to do that rainflow cycle counting. So it's performing the fatigue calculations now. It's taking a little bit longer. It will get there soon. There we are. So let's have a look at the equivalent stress. Now if we zoom into this area, you can see we've just got little stress raises here that could be areas of concern. The maximum principal stress, the minimum principal stress, and the normal stress. We can see the normal stress is very similar to the equivalent stress, a little bit lower, very equivalent to the maximum principal stress. Uh, if we go down to life then, the life is coming out at 1276. Actually, I expected it to be lower than that. 1276. If you recall, our design life was 1000 blocks. So we've taken, 79% of our design life. And if we look at our safety factor, it's just above one. And we can see the, the minimum factor of safety is down here. Uh, in order to check those values, let's look at our biaxiality indication and we can probe. I think it was at this result here. Or was it this one? Let me just check. Oops, I'm off the scale here. So it's this one here. Biaxiality indication, let's probe down here, and it's close to zero. So we've got a uniaxial case there. We can pretty, be pretty confident in these results. Let's have a look at the rainflow matrix. Scroll down, of course, it's windows. And here we can see the rainflow matrix for that uh, load history, the damage matrix. And we can see the high number or the, the majority of the damage actually is done by these mid-range, high number of mid-range alternating cycles. And then if we look at the fatigue sensitivity down here, we can look at the fatigue, fatigue sensitivity. And this is our load history. If we want to get to infinite life, if we can reduce the loading by maybe uh, 25, 30 percent, it's maybe not achieving infinite life, but we can take it from 1,000 blocks up to 10,000 blocks. So that's an example of how you work with complex load histories, uh, or what we call variable amplitude proportional loading. Now, just lastly, we've got 10 minutes left. I just want to talk a little bit about strain life. So strain life, as I mentioned at the beginning, is another technique we have. Uh, it's used for low cycle fatigue when we have a, a certain amount of plasticity in the model and it's typified by failure at less than 10,000 cycles. Uh, the ANSYS fatigue module, if you're using strain life, only supports constant amplitude proportional loading. And we calculate life based on, on this uh, function here, uh, where NF is the number of cycles to failure 
and he, he is the strain level. Uh, in terms of material properties, uh, we, we extract these strength coefficient, strength exponent, ductility coefficient, and ductility exponent, exponent from our strain life material testing, and those are used as material inputs. We'll see in a minute. Now, we don't include in the strain life calculation because we're using proportional loading methodology, we don't actually model plasticity in the FEA model. We don't include kinematic or isotropic hardening. It's not considered in the model. We use this Ramberg Osgood relationship to basically calculate the level of plasticity in our model. Material properties I mentioned is a little bit different. We don't enter an EN curve. We typically extract from the EN curve these parameters, which we enter these parameters. And then lastly, uh, the only, one of the only differences in, in to the SN approach is we don't use Goodman, Soderberg, and so on for mean stress correction. There are two different techniques, the simplest of which is the Moro technique for mean stress, stress connection. And the Moro technique will modify only the tensile mean stresses, mean stresses of the elastic term. Or you can choose to use the Smiths. Smith Watson Topper mean stress adjust, adjustment, and that adjusts both the tensile and the compressive um, mean stresses in the curve to adjust for non zero mean stress. Lastly, uh, in terms of examining the results, everything else, when you're working doing a strain life calculation, examining the results is just the same as the stress life and the examples I've just given. You can still calculate life, damage, safety factor, factor and so on. So in summary, then, the ANSYS fatigue tool, stress life and strain life approach, it's very useful for uniaxial or mildly biaxial stress states and allows you to do constant amplitude proportional loading. So these are where you've got a single load case and then you are, are cycling that load case, either zero based, fully reversed, or you can put in a ratio. I didn't show this in the demo, but you can put in a ratio. So you can multiply that single low case maybe by two in the tensile and to 0.5 in the compressive, for instance, by using the ratio condition. You can also do constant amplitude non-proportional loading. So that's where you're cycling between two separate load cases. If you remember, you use solution combinations to do that. And then if you've got a complex load history, you can do variable amplitude proportional loading, which involves this rainflow cycle counting of the complex load history. And as an output, we calculate life, damage, safety factor, fatigue sensitivity, and we give an indication of biaxiality just so you can do a sanity check of how accurate those results are. So that's the end of the presentation. I hope that you found that useful. I've covered most of the functionality in the ANSYS fatigue tool. Uh, as I say, just reiterate, if you've got any questions, please put them into the chat window and uh, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you very much.